good hand clap. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Well, I thank God and praise him again. Hallelujah for a, another night and another opportunity to uh, share the word of God. Amen. Nothing in life is more precious. Uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, we have a, uh, most everybody that goes inside prison, we always say, which is true, that we get more blessed than the people that we minister to uh, when we go inside. Uh, and that's what I'm, I say about uh, being able to come here and share uh, as often as I do, especially uh, when I come like four or five days or whatever, uh, this is really my time of refreshing. Amen. Uh, uh, I'm extremely busy at home. Hallelujah. I got five grown out of the house kids. That's really nice. But uh, I have three grandchildren that we have raised and are raising. I got one 20 uh, girl, and uh, so she uh, uh, just joined the Air Force, amen. She did a year at uh, Indiana State, and then she realized that she could go to the Air Force and have them pay for the rest of her college, amen. Very wise, very wise. So, uh, so she's there. Then I got a 16-year-old boy, amen. He's good. He loved uh, music, so he playing all kind of instruments, and he's in the high school band, uh, and so he really enjoys that, and his plan is to follow her, amen, into the military, uh, and then I got a nine-year-old, amen, and y'all know the rest of that story, amen, uh, anything she wants, anytime, uh, y'all see what I'm talking about, <laughs> she gets, so we have that, plus we have Kane, uh, which is a uh, 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 our pit bull, amen. Uh, so we have to take care of him. And then, of course, I got my wife, amen, that, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, my house is really uh, full, hallelujah. And then, of course, you know, I have the Jesus House, which is a reentry uh, program for just released Christian ex-convicts, or at least they say they're Christian, amen. And uh, we find out when they get there, uh, we don't put them out. You know what I'm saying? But we get them saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and healed, or they move on. Hallelujah. And uh, Jesus just been so good to us. You know what I'm saying? We always boasted we was a 46-bed facility, but we've had to up and down to where we can handle 60 men. Uh, and uh, we have 40 in there now. Amen. Uh, you know, from all walks of life. Uh, and so that's going well. And then, of course, I have the church. Amen. We have the church. And then next door to the church is a five-bedroom parsonage, which is also a south side Jesus house. Amen. And so we have three guys living there. Uh, and those are the ones that have graduated from uh, another unit to there. still want to be a part of the ministry. And so their job is to take care of the church. Amen. Take care of the grounds and all that kind of stuff, which they do a wonderful job. So not only that, but I'm in a prison every weekend. I say amen every weekend, amen. But I, I have to correct something because I was at uh, a Grace Fellowship in Louisville this morning, and a lot of people still thinking that I'm still on the road, amen. You know what I'm saying? You know, months at a time, uh, which ain't never been like that. But anyway, uh, I'm very seldom am I going a week, very seldom. You know what I'm saying? Now, every weekend I'm somewhere, uh, just about mostly local. Uh, I volunteer in three different prisons. Uh, in Indiana, and um, so I'm busy doing that as well. Uh, there's different, there's five, well, before I get started, I, I'm, I'm started, but I'm going so I do have a word for you, amen, but I'm, I'm just, you know, just idling my motor right now, amen, but, you know, Matthew 25 says I was in prison, and you visited me, amen, I just want to let y'all know I'm scriptural, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I haven't been in and out of prison for 13 years as an inmate, and then being involved in prison ministry for 40 years, that's 53 years. Amen. I'm 72, so that's 53 
years every day inside prison. It's kind of hard to talk about anything else. You know I me, mean? if you're doing that 53 years every day, you know what I'm saying? So, and I'm doing it every day, you know what I mean? Not only in prison, but we, uh, I send uh, uh, hundreds uh, of books and Bibles to prisoners all over the United States, as well as supply a bunch of chaplains with Bibles and books and all that. Plus, we got a large correspondence ministry. So we are extremely busy, amen, doing prison ministry. And, and I share it because most people think prison is we're going in, you know what I mean, having a Bible study, amen. Uh, uh, but uh, that's a Bible study. I mean, going in and having a Bible study, that's a Bible study. Amen. A lot of times people say it's prison ministry, but if it's jail, it ain't prison ministry. It's jail ministry. Hallelujah. So you got jail ministry and you got prison ministry. Amen. And, uh, and so we do, we do all of that. Uh, prisons are four levels, five levels of prisons. Most people don't know. You have level five, which is the, which is the highest security that a prison can have is a level five. That's where you have uh, all kind of crazy folks. I said, really crazy folk. You know what I'm talking about? Level five. I do a level five. I minister in there once a month uh, uh, in the level five. And then you have level fours, uh, level threes, and level twos, and level ones. Level ones is minimum security. Level two is a second grade higher. Level three is, is higher than that. And level four is higher than that. Level five is the highest. Now, that's based on the nature of the offense and the crime. So you got your murderers. You know, all them type of people, most of them is in level fives. Uh, uh, level fours, you understand, you might have some, but, you know, not, not, not many in there. Uh, and then you got level threes, a uh, lot of thefts. Uh, then you got level twos, you got level ones, which are minimum security. Uh, there's over 7 million folk incarcerated in the United States of America or under the direction of parole or probation. 7 million. Uh, and out of that 7 million... And I always have to say this to some people. Out of the 7 million, over half of them are in there for a nonviolent offense. I said it because some people felt like everybody's in prison, you understand, belong there, amen, uh, because of the killing and all that. But like I said, over half of them is in there for a nonviolent offense. And not only that, but all of them need to hear the gospel. Amen. And that's what it's all about. So we're all about sharing the gospel with them. I don't help no inmate get out of penitentiary. I don't write no letters to no judges. I don't call no judges, lawyers, or anything like that. I don't go to court. I don't do anything. I preach the gospel, teach faith, and if you if you op, if they operate by faith, God will work the miracle and get you out. I ain't getting you out. You might not be saved. Amen. Now you know people know the back, how many know people know the backslide. Amen. So I like, no, no, no. They might be able to con me. How I many know? But you can't con God. Amen. So I don't help nobody get out. Amen. But praise the Lord. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blessed man. Uh, I've, uh, we just had our revival, tent revival in uh, a prison in, 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 the, in the Annapolis. I don't want to do it in tongues. Uh, uh, and a uh, uh, couple of Friday, a couple of weeks ago, Friday, one service Friday. Two services Saturday, two, two services Sunday, and we was able to count over 200 men give their life to Jesus Christ in those services. So those are the type of, now that's, I, I, we don't, all my team, we don't speak evangelistically. So we always take the conservative number. You know what I'm saying? When I said 200, it was mo more than that, but that's all we could count. You know what I mean? Men would just stand up and just give their life to Jesus Christ. And uh, their prison loves us. This is our second year doing it. They want us to do that every year, have a tent revival in there. And that's a level, level two and a three. Uh, and uh, I teach Bible studies there every Saturday. And, of course, my Bible study last week almost doubled. So we like 125, 130 in the Bible study where we teach them how to do the Word of God. Amen. Uh, I have a church, but I also have a wife. Which love preaching. My wife loved preaching more than breathing. <laughs> and then I have a son. I got two sons, but I got a son that loves preaching and prison ministry as much as I do. And so as a result of that, they run the church. Hallelujah. I, got, I said they run the church. Amen. And so I'm usually there at least once a month. Hallelujah. And on top of that, then we had a Jesus house, and I'm teaching there three days a week. Amen. So 
when I come down here, I am extremely blessed. Amen. Uh, I can just I can just chill out. Hallelujah. Y'all see what I'm talking about? And pray up and see what God wants to do. So y'all ready for this? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you and praise you for your word with your spirit and his life. We thank you and praise you for each and every person that's present. Pray that you will open up the eyes of our understanding so we can understand your word in ways we have it considered. We give you praise, glory, and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Now, I know y'all word people, so I can always read more than one verse. Mark chapter 10. And you know, there's uh, all kinds, I mean, man, I mean, there's all kinds of books. Uh, I've seen all kinds of books in my 40 years serving God about uh, why do bad things happen to good people? And so I decided to address that after the Spirit of God told me to. Amen. And uh, here's the reason why. Now, they got thick books on this. <laughs> I was preaching this <laughs> uh, 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 in um, Georgetown, and there was a visitor there, you know what I mean, uh, a, a, a biker. You know, he had tattoos all over me, everything, you know what I mean. And, and so I was preaching this, and, man, he was on fire. And he said, man, I can't wait to get home and tell my wife what you just said. He's because she just got a book that thick on why bad things happen to good people. He said, I wrote the scripture down. Wait till I get home and tell my wife. Mark chapter 10, that was good confirmation. And verse number 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, talking about Jesus, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Why do bad things happen to good people? There are none. <laughs> I mean, you know, folks got all kind of books out. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus just said there are no good people. None. So bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things happen to people that's not born again. I say, man, you know what I'm talking about? Or happens to good people or born again people who, who are not operating in the word right. Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 2. Hallelujah. Got plenty of time. Plenty of time. Amen. Romans chapter 2. I'm used to preaching by the clock. I'm just not watching it here. But I mean, I'm used to preaching by the clock. Because <laughs> in prison, you understand, you only got an hour and a half. I mean, you got an hour and a half. I mean, if the Holy Ghost is moving, you got to cut it off an hour and a half. I say, man, the men going to leave. The men going to leave. I'm serious. You know, it's count time. I say it's count time. When count time comes, everything stops. So Romans chapter 2, amen, and in verse number 11, I'm reading out New King James Version, which is the one that Jesus wrote. Amen. <laughs> I always say it just in case the Muslims in the house. Amen. Don't get nervous now. You know, they would understand what I'm saying. Amen. All right. Romans <laughs> chapter 2 verse 11 says for there is no partiality with God another ver uh, another uh, maybe King James says there is no respect of persons with God so God does not have respect to persons he has respect to faith but he don't have respect to persons so that means it don't make a difference who we are we all have to operate the same way we have to all operate by faith. Is that right? Now, uh, I, you learn a lot from God's, I learned a lot from God's word. Maybe you know, I learned a lot from God's word by observing what it does not say. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 2. Everybody don't have it, so hold on. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians chapter uh, 2 and uh, Ephesians chapter 2 
and verse number 8. Ephesians 2 and 8. Now, I'm going to say this. It does not say, for by grace are you saved. It don't say that. Now, the reason why it don't say that because there ain't no period behind grace. I mean, is that right? If there was a period behind it, it would say, for by grace are you saved. Period. But it don't say that. It said, for by grace are you saved through faith. So grace, amen, is unmerited favor or Jesus. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Is that right? The Bible said the grace of God has appeared to all men. Amen. But just because the grace of God has appeared to all men, all men ain't saved. Even though it's God's will for all to be saved, everybody ain't saved just because the grace is here. I mean, is that right? We have to do something with that grace. We have to act upon that grace. And when we act upon that grace, that's called faith. So we ain't saved by grace. We're saved by grace through faith. I mean, is that right? Well, I mean, at least that's what the verse says. Amen. I believe the verse is right. Now, <laughs> look at Romans chapter 12. Hallelujah. Wonderful night. Wonderful night. Ephesians chapter 12. Oh, okay. I'm just making sure y'all woke. R Romans. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> R Romans chapter 12. Amen. Great crowd. Great crowd. <laughs> Romans 12 and 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, so he's talking to Christians, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, we know living sacrifice means holy. Amen. But there's also a, a, another uh, application to present your body a living sacrifice, which I tell guys this all the time. Go to church. Wait a minute, let me set it over here. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice also means going to church. You know, most people sacrifice something to go to church. You know, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people don't sacrifice. They're going to watch that program. I say, man, you know what I'm saying? I got company over. I ain't going to church today. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Not y'all, but I'm just saying some folk. Amen. But a living sacrifice means you got to give up something to do something. So he said, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, amen, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Transform means we change it to another person. I always explain it to guys in the joint because they can understand it a little bit deeper. Uh, transform, you understand, is like them transformers. You ever seen them transform, big, uh, you know, a robot, and you, and you, and you can keep on... Messing with it, it turns to, to a truck. Is that right? That's a transformer. How I many know that's, been, that's a transformer? So when he says right here, be transformed or change it to another person, let me see, let, let me read that again. Uh, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by grace that, uh, it, it, it don't say that? No, grace gets you saved. Amen. But faith is what transforms you. But now, wait a minute, notice right here. He's talking to saved folk here. Is that right? He called them brethren. Well, I thought once you got born again, you was already transformed. I mean, I thought once you got saved, you know what I'm talking about? You already, everything, everything's everything. I mean, you, you are a new person. Yeah, it says you're a new person in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are a new person in Christ Jesus, but your body don't know it. Your soul don't know it. Your, your mind, your will, and your emotions do not know that you are a changed man. So you're born again, but now you got to have your mind, your will, and your emotions transformed. And the only thing that does that is the Word of God. I mean, is that correct? So we have our mind, we have our, our mind, our will transformed. It says by the renewing of your mind. The best way I can explain renewing of your mind is, very simply, put something new on your mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, guys get born again, and they say, man, yeah, he got saved in this service. I tell them all the time, well, you're born again. You, you, you saved. You prayed the prayer. You're born again. You, you, you're born again. 
I say, now, if you go back to your unit, that's where they live at, and somebody get up in your face, some other inmate, and they're talking crazy, and you forget you saved, and you hear them in the mouth, this penitentiary talk, you know, and you go to the hole, you're still saved. You just have to learn how to control your emotions. How many know what I'm talking about? So, because so, a lot of them get, get born again, you know what I'm talking about, and then, you know, they, 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 they feel good for two or three days. Then after two or three days, the glow wears off. And they're in prison, then somebody talking crazy to them, you know what I'm Next thing you know, they didn't hit them in the mouth, amen. They didn't went to the hole, and when they get to the hole, the devil tells them or somebody else tells them, man, you really ain't saved. If you really were saved, you never would hit that guy in the mouth. I don't get nervous now, but I know folks say 40 years will hit you in your mouth. <laughs> you know, they're still working with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're still working on it. You, I, I mean, know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Thank God for forgiveness. Amen. But, 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 but we are transformed by the word of God so that we can do what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we find out according to uh, uh, uh Habakkuk 2 and 4, it says the just shall live by his faith. Hebrews 10 and 38 says the just shall live by faith. Is, is that right? I, I like what it, it don't say. Uh, uh, no goodness. Now, the grace is wonderful. So is love. Got to have it. But it don't say the just shall live by love. It don't say the just shall live by grace. It don't say the just shall live by mercy. It says the just shall live by faith. So I say, if you ain't living by faith, you ain't living. Oh, let me say it again. Say the just shall live by faith. Let me ask you a question. How often do you live? Or are, are you alive now? <laughs> now, we live 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So there's no such thing as a faith message. Uh, 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 let, let, me, let me read that again. <laughs> maybe, maybe I, but, uh, no, Hebrews 10, 38 says the just shall live by faith message, right? Uh oh, some of y'all said, right? Okay, let, let me, let, well, let me read this one right here, Romans 1, 17. It says, so then the just shall live by a faith message, right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say faith message. It ain't in there. Oh, that was a wonderful faith message. Hallelujah. <laughs> no. I mean, no. Wait a minute. If this is something that I got to live by every day, 365 days a year, it ain't no faith, faith message. It's a way of life. I can't live no other way. So now, if it's a way of life, then I, I should sure want to know what it is. Hallelujah. Well, I found out that faith is not, you know, faith is, it, you can see faith. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is that right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It didn't say faith is the substance of things hoped for, and faith cannot be seen. It said it's the evidence of something that can't be seen. Well, if faith is a substance, then it must be tangible. A chair is the substance. You can see it. And if faith is the evidence of what I can't see, then I must be able to see the evidence. Now, guys in the joint really get this and really get this. Because they know they was not convicted with evidence that couldn't be seen. <laughs> <laughs> when they say, we got you, we got the evidence. You know what I'm talking about? Then, okay, that, then I want to see the evidence. You know, that's what an inmate do. If, if you know anything, he filed for a motion of discovery. That means, you know, your lawyer, the prosecutor got to show your lawyer everything they got on you. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know some of y'all in here. You, you know, you, you, you know we, we ain't going to tell. We ain't going to tell. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> you know, we filed a motion of discovery. Amen. And our lawyer, they got to give our lawyer that evidence. That way, our lawyers see everything they got on us. And then we know now, based on what they got here, whether they got me or not. 
If they got me, I want a plea deal. Amen. If they ain't got no evidence, take it to trial. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, I know, you know, some of y'all know. You know. But, <laughs> so they got to have some evidence. They can't say I stole something and they ain't got no evidence. How can they say I stole something and didn't nobody see it? I wasn't caught with it. It's just hearsay. I heard you. No, hearsay is not evidence. Evidence is something that they can see, feel, and touch. So now if faith is the evidence of what I can't see. Now what I can't see is what I'm believing for. I can't see the money that I'm believing God for. I can't see the healing that I'm believing God for. Are y'all still here? Oh, yeah, I can't see that. So how do I know I got it? Because the faith says I got it. But now if faith says I got it and faith is tangible and evidence, where, where is it at where I can see it? Well, Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word is the evidence. So I know I'm in faith when I'm standing on the word. I ain't in faith because I really believe. You know, really believing is not faith. No, you ever notice that they're spelled different? Oh, let me say that again. <laughs> You ever notice that believing and faith is spelled different? Amen. Now, believing is part of it. Are y'all still here in the house? But I'm believing what? I'm believing what the Word says. I say, I'm believing what the Word says. I ain't just strong believing. Every time I minister along those lines by believing, I might have shared this here before, but faith don't come from having heard that. Amen. It comes from hearing. And every time I believe uh, a mission on this, uh, I, I remind a member of a, of a youth facility that I was in. Now, North Carolina is different than a year ago. I Michael's 60 Minutes. And on 60 Minutes, they had a program. They said, we want to show you uh, the youth facility in the United States of America that houses a 1,000 of the most dangerous young men in the country. And we looked at that, and they had this uh, youth facility called Western Carolina Youth Institute. We always call it uh, the high rise in Morganton, North Carolina. And it said it houses a thousand of the most dangerous young people in the world. I mean, in the United, in the United States. Now, these were young men that have committed adult crimes, and they got adult time, and they sentenced them there until they're 18 years old. And then they were sent them down to a so-called Youth Institute, which is how they do in North Carolina. And they stayed there until they were 21, and then they went off into adult uh, a prison. I never forget that. I seen that. And, and the show this one guy off the bus first time he got some time he's going in here and he's scared i mean he's scared and then they go home the program and at the end of the program they said we want to show you uh the most dangerous guy in the penitentiary in that youth facility and that was that guy there he came in and scared and by the time by the, when they got through with it he was running the joint that's a prison word joint and I, me and my wife, I said, now, this ain't right. You know, they shouldn't come into a youth facility like this here and get worse. So I prayed and believed God to open up the door. God opened up the door, and uh, we went in there to minister. Oh, I went in there to minister. I never forget now, you know, a uh, uh, dangerous place I knew. And he said, now, 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 <laughs> we're going to have a slide. And bring nobody to the bus Sunday. But they're going to have a Bible study on Thursday. So he said, so we can get a crowd, uh, I'd like to use you at bay. So he said, when you come tomorrow, I'm going to take you in the gym where they're playing ball. So they can see you, you can give a, you know, advertisement that you'll be at the Bible study and you'll be at church on Sunday. Well, you know, Jesus make us fishers of men. So you had to have the right bait. Amen. So I went down to the mall. Amen. Bought me a brand new pair of Jordans. Got me a nice shirt and everything to match. And then <laughs> we go into the gym. The ball, when we walk to the gym, you can hear the ball run. All of a sudden, the ball stops. And all these young cats, they come looking. They ain't looking at me. They're looking at the Jordans. And they say, hey, man, where you get those J's at? That's the first time I heard the word J's. They mean Jordans, you know. And I said, <laughs> I said uh, at the mall. Man, 
Then it costs. Well, $150. $150? What do you do? I'm a preacher. Preacher? You're a preacher. You got, I said, yeah, well, how you? Come to the Bible study, and I'll tell you. Bible study was full. <laughs> they want to know how to get to Jordan's. You know what I'm talking about? So I had already caught them. So then I told, so when, when Sunday come, don't get nervous now, the chaplain told me, he said, now, uh, uh, you can, they, all of them can come if they want to. He said, now, uh, this is all full of gang members, different rival gangs. So he said, so you got an hour, but, your, but, the, but their attention span is about 20 minutes. So he said, so you can go until you start seeing some activity. What do you mean activities? Flashing them signs. You know, them gang signs. He's now when they get like that, we're going to shut it down and get them out of here before, before they start fighting. And so, of course, I go, don't get nervous, I'm to the mall, got me another outfit. And I'm sitting up there, you know what I'm talking about, why they're going through the preliminaries, and all they're doing is talking, man, <laughs> you know, with each other, you know what I'm saying, about the J's that I got on, amen. And when I got up there to minister, you could hear a pin drop. And I ministered the whole hour. No, I mean, I gave all the call. I mean, it seemed like every guy in that place raised their hand to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Well, I go down, they hear about it. I go down to the Pope Youth Institute. The chaplain asked me to come down there. I go down there, and so I got a, they want me to have a service, so I, I'm thinking it'll be a small service. But the chaplain makes everybody in the place come to the service. It's a men facility. they in the gym. It's packed out, and I'm looking at them. They don't want to be there. You ever seen a bunch of teenagers, you know what I'm saying, don't want to be there? They don't want to be there. I mean, they're grumbling, you know what I mean, but they got to be there. And so I'm sharing the word of God, and I'm preaching, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm still talking about believing in, in, in faith. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm preaching everything, you know what I'm saying, and, and I'm looking at them, you know what I'm saying, half of them don't want to hear nothing. And so I share my testimony and how God, I give all the call, a bunch of them raise their hand to give their life to Jesus Christ, and I'm getting ready to get out of here. You know, you know, they ain't looking right. All of a sudden, the chaplain said, Reverend Bumpers, we still got a little more time. How would you like to answer some questions? I wanted to say no. <laughs> but I said, uh, uh, okay. And sure enough, on the top bleachers was the first question. The guy stands up and he says, how do you know there's a God? Well, you know, I know the Bible. I want to give him Psalms 24. The heavens declare his handiworks. But these are unsaved folk. They don't believe nothing. They don't know nothing about no Bible. So I want to give it to him in a way he can understand. So I said, well, brother, all that out there, you know, the sky, the moon, all of that. He says, well, I believe all that always has been there. I said, man, ain't nothing always been there. Everything had to have a start. And whatever started, whatever was started, is God. That's what his name means, creator. And then he said, well, I believe I'm God. I had to hold myself from laughing. I'm thinking here God is locked up and can't get out of the penitentiary. <laughs> but, but I didn't want to embarrass him. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, so I just ignored it. <laughs> and so we over, and so here's this other guy comes up, and so we're shaking hands, and he said, man, I heard that, and you're talking about believing God and faith, you know what I'm saying? He said, man, I was in jail, and I was believing. I mean, I know I was believing. I read the Bible, and I was believing, and I was believing that I wouldn't get all this time, whatever. I got it. I said, are you still believing? No. I said, well, you never was. Faith is more than just believing. And so then, you understand, he wanted to do us to repent. I, just because you got the time, don't mean saying you have to do the time. If God can turn it around and still bring you out of the penitentiary if you're in faith. Well, how did I get in faith? So I gave him some scriptures to stand on. I gave him Luke 4 where it says, Jesus came to set the captives free. As in New Testament, to so stand on that word and believe God, you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, and if you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away, behold, all things are new. So according to God, you ain't never committed no crime, so you're an innocent man incarcerated. Amen, but at least I left him with some humming. 
we know them about. You really there? The first one, the chaplain called me one day when I was going down there. He said, "Man, there's a guy want to talk to you." I said, "Okay." He said, "No, he's in the he's in the organization. That's no problem." He said, "He's pretty high up in the organization. No problem." So he got me one on one on him, and this guy, <clears throat> he was talking about, "Well, I really want to. I've asked Christ to come to my heart, and I just really want to know is it really real?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, it's real, 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 and everything." Folk. I know folks in the you know, learned gang years ago. But I knew a whole bunch of people that was in the mob. Not for the man. Amen. But <laughs> you know, because you can't be in the mob black. Again. Just in the you know what I'm talking about. Uh, 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 and so uh, and that'll get you about four in the morning. Don't worry about it. But but <laughs> and so I told I so I'm, I'm, I'm a, now, I know guys that was in the mob, and they got born again. God worked miracles got them out. So I'm telling this guy, he said, well, I'm, I'm in an organization. I said, okay, I understand all that. He said, but, yeah, I'm a leader of an organization. I said, no problem. You know what I mean? God still can get you out. He said, let me tell you something. He said, my only out is death. We talking about a 17-year-old kid. He says, I was a five-star general. Now, five-star is vice lord. Don't get nervous. going to preach you real good. And he said he was a five-star star, five star general. He said, my only out is death. He said, all I want to know is if this is real. If this is real, I ain't scared to die. I just want to know where I'm going to go. And I was able to encourage him that living with Christ is real. There is a heaven and there's a, and, and there's a hell. And that last thing I heard, they shipped him off to a man's prison. Other volunteers told me, that over the years, all he's been doing is preaching the gospel, laying hands on folk, and casting devils out. What well, then? It's the guy learning, learning how to operate by faith, knowing that God can take care of you any way you're at. He can do anything, but you have to do it according to the rules. So faith, you can see faith. I always give it to you like it's here. Well, we can see faith. So what is faith then? Well, this stuff, okay, something cool, wonderful. Break it down for me. I would like to break it down for you. Well, faith is acting on the word. You know, the leper came to Jesus, right? And said, you can heal me as you can heal us, right? Jesus said, I will. Then Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. The Bible said, as they went, they were healed. So how did they get healed? They, I mean, they weren't, according to the law, they weren't supposed to be showing up uh, at their priest's office, amen, without some signs of the healing leaving them. Otherwise, they could have been stoned to death. They didn't say, wait, hold it. I ain't going nowhere until you, you do something. Now, the Bible said, it said, as they went, they were healed. So as they went, in other words, as they acted on the word of God, how many know the miracle took place? So faith is acting on the word of God. We all know about Peter. Peter had his boat, you understand? He'd been fishing all night. Been fishing all night, he ain't caught anything. So he had washed all them nets. That was a tedious job. He had put the nets up. Here comes Jesus. Uh, 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 let down your net to catch some fish, your nets. And he said, well, basically, basically what Peter say, said was reverend. You know, he said master. But he really meant reverend. What he was saying is, reverend, I'm the fisherman. You be the preacher. I've been fishing all night. Ain't nothing out there. Night in the daytime. Otherwise, I would have been fishing in the daytime. Ain't nothing out there. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down a net. And he let, it, let down the net. What did he do? He acted on the word of God. Caught so many fish. How many know what I'm talking about? But he missed all of his harvest. He got part of it. He couldn't have got it all if he was 100% obedient. How many know what I'm talking about? He acted on the word to a point, and he didn't get all of it. All his friends had to come in there and get some of them fish because his fish, because his boat was sinking. Why? Because he acted on the word of God. Faith is acting on the word. So I know I'm in faith when I got a scripture that covers what I'm believing God for. If I ain't got no scripture to cover it, I ain't in faith. And if I ain't in faith, God ain't obligated to do nothing. 
Hallelujah. That's why I'm still here today. I say I'm still here today of cancer. Amen. I say I'm still here. Satan tried to attack me. Don't get nervous. Come preach me good. You know they say that. You know they say there's a possibility I might come back in two, you know in two years. No way. No way, Jose. I said no way, Jose. And so three or four weeks ago, don't get nervous. Three or four weeks ago, I went in for my my uh, you know examination. They put the thing through your nose, all down your throat, and they seen a scar on my throat. And they said, uh oh. I don't know what. <laughs> we see something. And I said, well, that ain't nothing. Don't pay no attention to that. No, we got to do a biopsy. Anyway. Well, okay, you do what you got to do, but I know it ain't there. So they said, we're going to do it. And then, you know what I'm saying? We, and then they're going to take us, we want to do a thorough, you know, thorough thing on it, you know, examination. So it's going to take about 10 days. You know what I'm talking about? And so they did, they did their little thing. Amen. Uh, but see, it was too late. I, it's too late. Satan only, got, only had one shot at me. I don't give him 15. He only get one. If he missed then, it's too late. And so I'm riding. I'm on, on my way to prison. It's something like three days later. I'm on my way to prison and the phone ring. Reverend Buff, is this, is this, is this Pastor Buff? Yes, it is. We just got back your biopsy, and I know you didn't want to wait no 10 days. There is absolutely no cancer in your body. Well, I already knew that. So I said, hallelujah. She said, hallelujah. And so I guess about the next five, uh, five miles, we both were shouting over the phone. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> we have to always stay in faith. Why? Why do we have to stay in faith? Because the just shall live 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And it don't make no difference what, you de what, you, what you're dealing with. Don't get nervous because I'm preaching very good. All I would like to say is, uh, now, we, the Jesus house, don't, don't get there, paid for. I said, Jesus house paid for. Uh, my church paid for. I said, amen. And, and, and I ain't had a job in 40 years. I said, I ain't had a job in 40 years. And I work, and 99% of my time I'm in prisons, and they won't even give me a bag of cookies. I'm talking about the inmates. <laughs> you don't get nothing. I'm just bringing out a point. Now, if I, if, 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 now, if, if God can manifest my, now I ain't got no business on the side. I say I ain't got no businesses on the side. My wife don't work. She ain't never had to work. I say my wife don't work. And yet we got the Jesus. We don't get no federal grants, no state money or anything like that. Hallelujah. Light bill at the Jesus house is around $6,000 a month. We got four furnaces in there. It's a big place. I said $6,000 a month. Wait a minute. Water bill is $2,000 a month. $2,000 for a water bill. Now, <laughs> the water is $800, but it's $1,200 for sewer. I was telling the guy, we're going to have to cut them, you know, them restrooms out. Yeah. <laughs> no. But... <laughs> <laughs> now that's the Jesus house. They ain't, they ain't talking about the church. You know what I'm saying? We we paying about the same thing at the church. You know what I'm talking about? Because we got three furnaces there. Amen. And air conditioner. Amen. Plus the five bedroom house there. Plus not on that day, you got my house. No job. No businesses on the side. No federal grants. No state money, anything. Amen. Inmates ain't got a dime. And don't get no money from the prison. But yet, we've been there for 16 years. Lights ain't never went off. Water ain't never been shut off. At, at there, my house, or no other place. I said, no other place. Why is that? Well, he said he'll meet every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I don't, I'm not concerned. When the bill comes, Lord, you already know it's yours. This ain't, this ain't Bumper's house. It's Jesus' house. <laughs> I remind him all the time, but this ain't William Bumpus' ministry. This is Jesus inside prison ministry. His ministry. Amen. I work for him. And God is the best employer in the world. There's a lot of folk that I know of that, that, that believe in God for ministry. 
You know, uh, God has blessed me. I, I, uh, when I said we did our revival there, 15 of the guys that are going with me, all ex-convicts, guys that I won to the Lord, some of them that came from the Jesus house, I've ordained them. I've ordained seven that are pastoring. They came from the Jesus house, so I led them to the Lord while they was in prison. They're living good. I mean, living good. You know what I'm saying? Serving God. If you didn't know them, you, you, if you didn't know anything about them, you'd never think they've ever been locked up for anything in their life. These were some dangerous folk. And yet God meets every one of our needs all the time. And I tell them, tell them, and other people all the time, a lot of folk is looking for money to do ministry. It don't work like that. Ministry produces money. You said it over here. Ministry produces money. When God sees somebody that's on fire, that made up their mind they're going to be a soul winner, God moves everything out of the way in order for you to do what he called you to do. When he finds somebody that's obedient, see, I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going, uh, well, I had, I proved it, proved it my first time coming to Kentucky, and I'm closing with this, 1986. That's when the, uh, St. Mary's first opened up, privately ran prison, was opened up down here in St. Mary's, Kentucky. It was an inmate in there, and uh, 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 I used to get Thompson Chain Bibles from the Thompson Chain Company. They used to give me like two cases of 24 of them a month. And so at that time, I wasn't going into many prisons, so I sent him a Thompson Chain Bible. And then I had some tapes, so I sent some CDs, uh, 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 tapes, and uh, he thought I was a white guy. Well, let me, yeah, I, I know I don't sound like it, but he thought I was a white guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> I guess because, you know, black, most black folk who, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, Jesus, and I wasn't. You, you know what I'm talking about? So... <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, 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 and so he was now I've been trying to I've been trying to go inside prisons but back then uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of them was closed we, in Indiana they was all close to me we was going some other places but they was all close to me and uh, he said uh, you know he, now, now, now you don't go chaplains don't ask you to come to prison hardly for those who want to do prison ministry they don't ask you to come you have to contact the chaplain's office you know what I'm saying? And see if they'll let you in. You know what I mean? It ain't like chaplain going to call you. You know, nine times, very seldom do a chaplain call me. Sometimes they do. They ain't got my books. You know what I mean? The man makes a demand on it, and then the chaplain will contact me. But 99% of the time, you have to call the chaplain and see, see and arrange to go in there and minister. And so, I, you know, I couldn't get, hardly go nowhere uh, in Indiana. So this inmate wrote, and he said, man, I know the chaplain real well. And I believe that if you call the chaplain, uh, he'll let you come down here. Well, I know better. And I always want to say it like, want to act like they know more than what they do know. And so, but I knew, I said, now, if I don't do this, and he asked me, uh, I ain't going to lie to him. So I'm going to call the chaplain. And i never forget it. I called chaplain. It was Chaplain Browning. Never had met him. I called down there. I said, yes. I said yeah, my name is Pastor Bumpers, and an uh, uh, inmate here, Walter Seeley. Yeah, I know Walter. Uh, he said it might be an opportunity for me to come down here and minister. He said, yeah, when you want to come? I said, well, when you want me? He said, what about next week? So I said, amen. Uh, this is back in the 80s. I think I had like a 1978 El Dorado with no shocks. And me and my wife, amen, got, and a couple other people got in there, and we rolled down like this. <laughs> I mean, man, I, I, I had a wonderful time. But there, there had been many, back in the day, there was many times I rode uh, on the road, and I had gas money to get down to the, down the highway. And, 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 and all the time I'm calling my wife, you know, I'll show you how long ago this was, you had to get a money order. They didn't have the bank cards and all. I don't know, that, that was a long time ago. I had to call my wife. Did anything come in the mail yet? Why? Because I didn't have gas money. But, I would, but I'm going. Jesus said, go. So I'm going, and, my, and uh, my faith is he'll supply all you need. And I would ride down there, uh, I mean, going down. By the time I got where I was going, somehow or another, God would be in work the miracle. Amen. And I'll be and got some gas money to come all the way back home. It started off like that. What was I doing? I was operating in faith. He said, go, I went. I didn't say, okay, God, I'll go if, I'll go when 
No, he says, go, you have to go. And when you act on the word of God, that's when the miracles start. Then he's just started supplying and supplying. Now, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's no problem. I say, it's no problem. Plenty of money, plenty, plenty of money, plenty of money. Amen. I say, amen, plenty of money. God meets every need. I mean, I, I, which is, I tell folk all the time, which is true. I do not have one need, literally. None. Ministry have needs. Ministry always have needs. Me personally, I don't have none. My wife, we don't have no needs, none. I mean none. We working on them desires. Amen. Amen. I desire. You know something I'm talking about? Before I have a need, every need is met. I say amen. Ministry always have needs, and the reason why, because you're always growing. You know, I mean, if you go, if you got a ministry, if you're serving God, you should, you know, you're always growing. You're always reaching for more. And God always supplies. So as I end this message tonight, ain't no good people. <laughs> yeah, let's, you know, let you know I, I ain't forgot. Amen. Y'all see what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, that's the moral of the story right here. Bad things happen to good people because there are no good people. And bad things keep on happening to them until they learn how to be good. And the only way you learn how to be good, you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And then after you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then you got to get into good fellowship, amen, and you have to learn the word of God so you can be transformed, amen, into the person that God has ordained for you to be. And then things just start going, I mean, things just go, start going well because God is a miracle worker. I had a guy, y'all stand, uh, 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 a friend, uh, uh, I mean, uh, he just tells miracles. That was a guy, I used to, go, used to go to Florida a lot. Don't too much go down there too much now except one or two places uh, because what happens is a commissioner will come in, uh, Department of Correction, they don't like ex-convicts. So they'll just kick you out of the whole system. That's how it is down there in Florida now. So I go to a privately ran prison. But years ago when I went down there, there was a guy, he was on death row. And uh, uh, the only way he got off death, he was on death row because him and, and his partner was doing some uh, robbing uh, federal uh, boxcars, trains, if you will. And uh, so they got into it with an with a officer, and the officer was killed. So they put him on death row. He deserved it. He deserved it. And the only way he got off death row years ago, I think in the, late in the 80s, they had a moratorium on the death penalty. They found that the death penalty was unconstitutional across the United States. And for about three years, everybody that was on death row, they commuted their sentence to life. So that's the only way he got off death row. And so he was a Muslim imam. That means head Muslim, teacher. And so he heard me in a prison, heard about me in a prison, being me being an ex-Muslim. And so he said he decided uh, that he was going to straighten me out. Wrong. But anyway, so he decided to come to the service to straighten me out. Well, what happened was the Spirit of God was in there, and he wasn't able to say anything or do anything. So he just sat there and listened. And then he said that Friday, Fridays, Muslim had what you call Yuma prayer, J-U-M-A, Yuma prayer. Uh, and so Friday, he said he's getting all this stuff together in the chapel so they can have uh, prayer. That means they get their prayer rug out and all that. And he's going through the chapel, and he says all of a sudden the chapel lit up in the prison. And this voice spoke to him and said, Willie Allen, this is your last warning. And he recognized that as Jesus. And he went into the chaplain and told the chaplain, he said, uh, you know who I am and what I represent, but you got to get me saved. And the chaplain led him to the Lord. Well, I met him years at, uh, 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 met him a couple years after that. I mean, the brother could sing. Could sing. You know, some people can sing. The others can sing. See, they can sing. They can't sing. They can sing. There's, there's a whole lot of difference between singing and singing. But so, this, so every time I go down there. You know, I mean, every time I go down there, you know, he was singing. He had a little group, you know what I'm saying? So they do some praise and worship for him and everything. And I told him, I said, now, man, uh, uh, whenever the Lord work a miracle in your life, you got a place to go. Well, he wound up, he had 26 years in. 
He had no paperwork nowhere. And I went down there the week before and ministered, and I come home, and a week after I'm, I come home, I get a phone call, and I tell God, we get guys all over the country, so we send them an acceptance letter, and on the acceptance letter, we tell them, here's the phone number to the Jesus house. When you get to the bus station, call us. We'll pick you up. Don't worry about nothing else. We got clothes and everything else. So uh, I'll look up, and here's the phone ring. And I said, who is this? Is this Willie Allen? Where are you at? Bus station in Indianapolis. What? How you get down there? They just let me out. I said, okay, don't go nowhere. I'll be, I, let me call you right back. So I called the prison. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, and I asked the chaplain, I said, uh, Willie Allen is down here in the bus station. Uh, is everything all right? He said, yeah. Said, they just walked there on him and said, Willie Allen, are you ready to go home? And he said, yeah. They said, get your stuff. He said, what stuff? Because <laughs> he thought they had made a mistake. He left everything. He said, man, he got on the bus from Florida all the way to Indianapolis, and he said he started singing on that bus. You know, he'd been locked up 26 years. Folk was telling him to get quiet. He said, man, the more they told him to get quiet, the louder he got. Made it to Indianapolis. We picked him up. For the last, for, for 10 years, he did wonderful there, wonderful. Then he moved back down to Orlando, Florida. Now, they got a group down there called ex Con for Christ, a bunch of guys who I led to the Lord. And they go back into those same prisons where they served time at down there in Florida, living a great life for God. Amen. Why is that? The word of God works. It don't matter what situation it is, the word works if you work the word. Amen? Y'all get anything out of that? Amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Good stuff, right? <laughs>